So hello and Jebim everyone. Welcome to the second session of our series, Anti-Caste Histories and Solidarities. My name is Dr. Rupali Bansode. I'm a Dalit feminist scholar and a social anthropologist. I'm coordinating this series with Dr. Swati Kamwe, who's also a Dalit feminist scholar um, and intersectional, um, and she believes in intersectional uh, feminism and intersectional politics. The series is funded by uh, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung uh, Foundation based in Germany. All the speakers, moderators, and coordinators of the series uh, receive an honorarium in presenting their work and in collaborating in this series. And we are thankful uh, to RLS for collaborating with us uh, in this program. Uh, this series is part of the yearly program that South Asian Scholars and Activist Solidarity, uh, SASAS, a group of young researchers and scholars based in, uh, in Europe, have planned since 2017. Uh, Dr. Swati Kamre has been an active member of SASAS since 2017. And this year, this lecture series has come out of a collaboration between SASAS and um, DBAV Women, Trans uh, and Non-Binary Peoples Collective which is an autonomous group of three generation of Dalit, Bahujan, Adivasi, and Vimitta and trans uh, and non-binary activists. This collective stands for horizontal and inclusive collaborations. Both SASAS and DBAV uh, uh, People's Collective consider intersectional feminism and non-hierarchical autonomy as the core ideologies of their collectives. I became part of both SASAS and DBAV People's Collective in October 2022. Uh, in October 2020, when Dr. Kamre initiated the lighter group post the Hathras gang rape case um, that, uh, that happened in uh, September 20, uh, 2020, uh, SASAS has been organizing programs for grounding anti anti caste thought and politics since 2017. This year's collaboration with DBAV People's Collective brought us closer towards brainstorming on the multiple coordinated groups in India. While thinking about a much talked identity like Dalit, we follow, uh, we follow Gopal Gurus and Sharmila Reges uh, and, Go and other scholars like Gail Omvid, uh, Gail Omvid and other scholars, and especially the Dalit Panthers idea of Dalit, wherein Gopal Guru's words, for the Dalit Panther, the category of Dalit is a revolutionary one for its hermeneutic ability to recover the revolutionary meaning of the historically historical part, past of the Dalit people. As the Panthers and the and Babura Bagul define it, this category has an ontological ability to define itself with all the lower castes, tribal people, toiling classes, and women. Thus, the use of the category Dalit by the Panther only shows how radically it is distinct from the understanding offered by its opponent. This excerpt is from the chapter Understanding the Category of Dalit from the book Auto Free in Dalit Politics, um, written by uh, Gopal Guru. Uh, edited by Gopal Guru, actually. Uh, simultaneously, we also consider other categories, other identities like Bahujan, Adivasi, Mool Nivasi, and other marginalized um, identities important, and thus thought of inviting scholars and activists working in working uh, and creating and doing Antika scholarship and politics important. This series is a conscious yet humble attempt to engage in challenging yet important questions like how do historically oppressed diverse communities with emancipatory movements, histories, investigate, imagine, and build Antika solidarities? Why is, um, why is this engagement with these histories and solidarities critical? How castle dominates and shapes the lived realities of Dalits and, uh, uh, and many other marginalized groups in India? How, does, how, does this, how do the state and its system as it exists fails and yet uh, remains the only source for the oppressed caste and minorities to seek justice. We are very happy to have um, to have um, uh, our, our, our today's speaker and moderator, Disha Vadekar and, uh, and Nikita Sonavne on board. Both are lawyers and doing some significant work on the intersection of caste law and marginalization. I would like to start by introducing um, our moderator for our today's session and then hand over the hand over the um, today's session to her. So uh, advocate, uh, advocate Nikita Sunaune has worked as a legal researcher and an, uh, as an advocate for five years. She is the co-founder of the Criminal Justice and, Polit and Police uh, Accountability Project, a Bhopal-based litigation and research intervention focused on building accountability against criminalization of marginalized communities by the police and the criminal justice system. 
her writings have been uh, have been intersection uh, how they have been on the intersection of policing caste and digitization of the criminal justice in india nikita has previously worked on issues of local governance forest rights and gender in the adivasi region of dang in gujarat she graduated with a, with a the degree in political science uh, with a bachelor's degree in which with a bachelor's degree in political science from st xavier's college mumbai and an llb degree from government law college mumbai nikita holds an llm in law and development degree from azim prem ji university bangalore her writings have been published by ai now institute at nyu indian express the hindu karwa and men uh, among others um yeah uh, and uh, nikita please uh, take the session ahead thank you thank you so much uh everyone for joining in jai bhim jai savitri hal johar uh, thank you so much to swati and rupali for curating this wonderful lecture series uh, of course a big thanks to the rosa luxemburg uh, institute for supporting this series um, i'm very excited to be moderating uh, today's conversation uh, both because of the subject matter and the person uh, who's going to be sharing her thoughts on the subject matter uh so i think today's question uh and the subject of today's question is particularly relevant because uh the phrase criminalization of dissent has gained coinage uh particularly in post 2014 india resulting um in the in, from the incarceration of certain lawyers activists scholars uh whose incarceration has been deemed to be political um and we've seen this incarceration largely happen under uh, draconian laws uh, like the unlawful activities prevention act uh it is therefore against this background that it becomes necessary to deconstruct and contextualize the category uh, of dissent and dissenters um i'm very excited to open the floor uh to disha wadekar for her to share uh, and help us make meaning of these ideas as part of her comments uh, on the topic of today's discussion aptly titled the caste of dissent uh, before that i would like to take the opportunity uh, to introduce disha disha is an independent advocate practicing at the supreme court of india and adjunct faculty at the jindal global law school sonipat she has previously worked as an associate at the chambers of senior advocate indira jay singh on constitutional matters including the shabimala and jarnail singh which is was the reservation and promotions case disha has also headed a legal resource center in india set up as a london school of economics project in addition she has worked as a consultant advocate for the death penalty project at the national law university in delhi she is the co-founder and president of seed an organization working towards a diverse and inclusive legal profession and the judiciary without any further ado and with much excitement i open the floor to disha to share her thought thanks uh, thanks nikita for that uh, lovely um, uh, you know introduction and setting the context of uh, the topic today uh, this topic is uh, particularly close to my heart and i've been pondering and thinking um and arguing with myself and people around me about this topic especially for the last two years uh and nikita here uh, you know has been a part of those conversations uh that we've had um so um uh, you know uh, i'll i'll kind of set the context in which uh, i thought of uh, you know um uh, i chose this topic um uh, in the last like nikita said you know um uh the current uh, political dispensation and the violence of uh the violent nature of the current political dispensation is uh, what has been in news for a long time um and we have seen with the arrests of intellectuals lawyers um uh, and uh, uh, you know very, very many well known personalities uh who have been incarcerated and who have been languishing in jails uh for and they have been termed as dissenters right um and um, even as they have been termed as dissenters um i have always thought of uh, you know and and what would always um sort of um, um trouble me was that uh, 
uh, these individuals, whether it was the Bhima Koregao case, um, or uh, you know the the incarceration of many intellectuals in uh, after in the aftermath of Bhima Koregao and the Ilgar Parishad, or say um, you know the attack and the arrests of uh, um, individuals after the anti CA and RC protests in uh, India, or the incarceration of individuals, uh, intellectuals, academics, lawyers, uh, journalists also, uh, say after Delhi riots in the aftermath of Delhi riots. And um, or, or say the recent uh, attack of Pegasus, uh, you know, where many human rights defenders, um, their, their uh, devices were hacked uh, by a military grade software. Right. Um, and we have and, and, and these people and their incarceration and their stories and their arrests um, and um, the plight of uh, these incarcerated uh, uh, individuals is has been in news for a really long time. Um, but I have always wondered what happens to um, the communities uh, that, uh, you know, and I, I will call them dissenting communities and I'll tell you uh, why dissenting communities? What happens to these communities, the marginalized communities, the SCs, the STs, the OBCs, uh, the Vimukta communities, the nomadic communities? What happens to these communities that have um, traditionally, um, historically been dissenting communities and why have they been uh, completely depoliticized? So if you see um, the, the discourse around civil liberties in India is, uh, highly focused on this category of political prisoners. Um, uh, and political prisoners are seen as these uh, intellectually inspired individuals uh, associated with martyrdom, associated with a sense of, uh, uh, you know, saving um, uh, uh, the, the society from uh, an oppressive state, right? And that brings me to the fact that uh, the NCRB data time and again is telling us that SCs, STs, OBCs account for 66% of under trial um, prison, prisoners population, right? Um, you have the death penalty in the uh, report, which says that close to um, three fourths of, uh, uh, you know, persons who are sentenced to death come from the SCST OBC communities, right? And I'm talking about administrative categories here and I will deconstruct those administrative categories a little later, but I'm just uh, flagging this data, uh, you know, for us to um, think about. So when you're talking about incarceration, there are these communities uh, that have been incarcerated that are languishing in jails. Uh, you have these communities that are disproportionately um, you know, sentenced um, uh, um, as far as death penalty is concerned. You have the communities, so a recent, uh, not a very recent, but um, uh, uh, the data by uh, NCSC, the National Commission of Scheduled Caste says that denotified communities, um, and it actually refers to a, a community called Kuruvan community from Tamil Nadu. And it says that uh, this community and members of these communities uh, face the risk of uh, being uh, booked under various criminal cases, at least, you know, five, uh, at least five criminal cases, uh, uh, you know, that's the risk that they face uh, in their lifetime, right? So the minute you are born in a denotified tribe in a Kuruvan community, you know that there, there are going to be five, that, that there is a risk of five, uh, that you, you being booked under five criminal cases, right? Uh, and that is the status um, of the manner in which the criminal justice system has targeted uh, marginalized communities, whether it is the Dalit community, Adivasi community, Vimukta community, uh, nomadic uh, communities and wandering communities in this country. Um, so uh, what I felt was this, this um, sort of centering of this category of political prisoners as these dissenting individuals and mostly Brahmin Savarna individuals, right? Um, and, and the deliberate erasure or the deliberate depoliticization of communities uh, that have, uh, you know, traditionally and historically dissented. Right, uh, that that kind of 
depoliticization of communities that on the on the one hand you see that the data shows that they are disproportionately criminalized communities are disproportionately criminalized but you see like a deliberate erasure of these communities from any discourse on civil liberties from any discourse on dissent right um so so this kind of um sort of um, uh, you know the 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 um disbalance uh, of the civil liberties discourse is is what really triggered me um, at one point and i uh, thought of uh, you know deconstructing uh, this this whole notion of dalit adivasis vimukta communities uh, not being political or or their depoliticization uh, we we the criminal justice system right and as nikita pointed out you know this 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 whole discourse that uh, dissent is being criminalized um and uh, and uh, it is a regime based phenomena that it is happening now um uh is does a lot of disservice because the reality is that dissent has always been criminalized and one will have to trace it trace its roots not just in the current political dispensation it is not a regime based phenomena one will have to trace its roots in uh the colonial and also the pre colonial times right um and especially in the caste social order and the brahminist uh socio political system right uh you will see that so so my attempt here is going to be to understand uh the descent uh of these communities uh and um uh, i i am going to take uh dr babasaheb ambedkar dr babasaheb ambedkar's writings as as my framework to understand uh how the communities that you now see are criminalized and over criminalized or disproportionately criminalized they at one point have been dissenting communities and one will have to see it through uh you know especially manusmriti right the text the penal code that existed before any penal code before any uh you know colonial indian penal code existed right um and uh, dr babasaheb ambedkar in um you know revolution and counter revolution in ancient india uh, really gives that framework of dissent for us why these are dissenting communities he talks about how manusmriti is this document or this 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 sort of gospel of brahminist subjugation of the buddhist the egalitarian buddhist tradition and anyone and everyone who tried to embrace this egalitarian buddhist tradition can be seen as a as a dissenting community right and you find evidence of this in manusmriti in fact um so um i'll just read out uh some excerpts from manusmriti in fact the manusmriti uh as we all know is a text uh that has imposed many injunctions on shudra on the shudra community of women and so on and so forth but the manusmriti also refers spe specifically to uh criminal communities and the word criminal communities has been used in the manusmriti in fact robber and thief communities this term also has been used in the manusmriti and it refers to non aryans or excluded aryan communities here in you know excluded aryans are the shudra community these are the people who dwell outside villages i'm reading from uh, manusmriti uh, these are the communities that dwell outside the villages on burial grounds mountains in grooves uh, wearing garments of the dead wandering from place to place and they are referred in the manusmriti they are referred to as criminal communities right um the manusmriti is replete with writings on the bastardization of certain communities and baba saheb has extensively written about uh, why uh, manusmriti um, did that you know whether it was the chandalas the nishads and all these other communities um and you see that 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 criminalization of these communities the communities that i'm talking about the excluded aryans the non aryans those who dwelled outside the village on burial grounds if you look at all these you know these these communities you can see that it is referring to a varna communities the communities who fell outside the varna system who rejected or did not believe in the chaturvarna system right 
now these are the communities that can be seen or or, or um, one can associate them with the larger egalitarian buddhist tradition right uh, and i call them dissenting communities because they dissented uh, the the brahmanic chaturvarna system and their criminalization their subsequent stigmatization and their criminalization and their bastardization that you see in the manusmriti is actually a result of that dissent and that's why i want to say that these are absolutely no one nobody can deny that they are apolitical or uh, or depoliticize these communities their very existence their very um, presence uh, is political right um so uh i mean i will also now want to go ahead and trace uh the condition of these dissenting communities and what happened to them in the colonial period for me it is really important i think this part especially was really important uh the one to sort of debunk the myth that uh, criminalization of communities and marginalized communities is a colonial pheno phenomena right um and a lot of savarna authors have been advocating that um and uh, i think I, i have done um uh, enough uh, uh i have put most of my time in actually trying to debunk this myth and i have focused on the pre colonial era to see why is it that these so called wandering communities communities that dwell that were dwelling in forests that means the forest tribes or communities that uh, wore leather garments you know which is which is clearly referring to uh, certain avarna communities why is it that these communities found place in the criminal tribes act and you can trace it uh, to the pre colonial times and to the brahmanist uh, subjugation right of these communities now you coming to the criminal tribes act you know 1871 and and the colonial era that criminalize close to 200 castes and tribes uh, and and i use the word castes and tribes because the word tribe in the criminal tribes act is a misnomer uh it's a misnomer in the sense that the british looked at everyone um uh, in india and and uncivilized people as um uh, as tribes right uh, so you will see that uh, as far as the criminal tribes act is concerned that criminalized certain communities at birth this act when it came into being it was it it did not happen uh you know as um like an isolated phenomena there is a history to it so uh in fact mukul kumar uh, has written an, a, a brilliant piece and if you uh you know if you have time please go through this piece it's called relationship between caste and crime uh it's pub it's been published in epw and he says that of course the colonial legal system uh was informed by its own victorian notions of criminality right which were hereditary notions of criminality that were informed by scientific race theories and by scientific race theories i mean where uh you know that the, there is a certain racialization of certain communities uh especially the ones on the margins uh and associating them with uh crime or, or criminality and criminal criminality at birth right so that's hereditary criminality and you will see that uh you know in uh, europe many communities like the roma community the sintis irish travelers um these are all nomadic vagrant so called vagrant migratory communities right and they were seen as a, as a threat by um europeans uh they were seen as a threat by uh, you know the british uh and vagrancy acts and habitual offenders act or acts similar to criminal tribes act that criminalized certain communities existed uh even in europe much before the british came to india right so they were already coming with their own notions that certain communi communities are used to um uh you know these kind of uh, 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 uh have associations with criminality and are used to committing crimes uh and in fact that article interestingly also says that somewhere that notion is uh deeply entrenched uh, in uh the protection of private property so nomadic communities or migratory communities are communities that did not believe in private property 
right? And because they do not believe in private property, the, to protect private property, the uh, Europeans actually criminalize these communities because they thought that they, these communities will have no regard for private property, right? Uh, so, so they were coming with these they were already coming with these notions to India. They had the external civilizing mission uh, in their mind, right? Uh, as colonizers, where they wanted to civilize this part of the world. Uh, but there was also an in already internal civilizing mission that was happening in India. And here I would uh, want to, uh, you know, I would like to connect this internal civilizing mission with Manusmriti, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Brahminical social order. Right. So this internal civilizing mission that was criminalizing certain communities and saying that they do not belong to the mainstream uh, Brahminical socio-political fold and they were being criminalized. And what happened was there was this collusion, this uh, collusion of the colonial uh, notions of hereditary criminality on the one hand and uh, the Brahminical social order in India on the other. And Mukul Kumar says that uh, the Europeans and the colonizers, uh, the British, uh, found suitable, uh, the, uh, their notions found suitable refuge uh, in the existing Brahminical or caste social order that, 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 that existed in India, right? So crime came to be seen as an occupation now, right? We, we, we already had a system where uh, caste, um, an occupation was imposed on uh, a certain, uh, on every community, right? Um, and here you had crime that was seen as an occupation, right? Um, and uh, that led to actually the, the enactment of the Criminal Tribes Act. The other uh, sort of um, view on this is that the 1857 revolt that happened, and this is, this is more in the popular discourse, and some scholars talk about it, that the 1857 revolt that happened against the British, uh, it had many of these lower castes, tribes, Dalit communities, all these communities that uh, uh, challenged the British uh, rule, the British Raj. And as a result of, of this challenge, uh, they were criminalized and they were put into the Criminal Tribes Act and defined as criminal tribes, right? Now this Criminal Tribes Act um, had a provision of registering all such, uh, you know, itinerant craftsmen communities, trad traders, uh, nomadic traders, entertainers, peasant communities, uh, certain untouchable castes, forest tribes, all of them were registered as criminal tribes, right? And this meant when, when you were, you were uh, branded as a criminal tribes, you were branded a criminal at birth. So this, this really important principle that we talk about, you know, about uh, you know, uh, that, that one is not uh, um, uh, guilty until proven to be, right? Did not apply to these criminal tribes. They had been criminalized the minute they were born, right? And what this, this act did was it gave you an entire machinery to then control the movement, uh, the lives um, of these communities. Right, so where they can go, where they cannot go, which area they are contained in, um, and it also gave penal, um, you know, provisions and measures uh, against the movement of these communities. It provided us a very special surveillance mechanism, constant surveillance mechanism uh, on these criminal tribes, right? And it was an extremely, extremely draconian law. It is uh, this act was amended many a times. Uh, I will cite a few amendments to these uh, to this act, one of which was, again, a very draconian provision, which was where these communities were put in open jails, right? And you find some references of uh, these open jails. In fact, I come from Pune, and the Khadakwasla Dam, is, which, which is one of the biggest dams uh, in Pune, was built by the Wadar community. Now, Wadar community is... Um, again, a nomadic community of stones, you know, sculptors. Um, and this community was criminalized. They are migrants from Andhra Pradesh. And um, when they were criminalized under the Criminal Tribes Act, they were put into these open jails where they were made to do hard labor. Um, and, and they had no choice. So it was a system of slavery 
wherein labor was extracted from these communities and they were not allowed to move in any manner possible. So it was these open jails and their labor was used to build these so-called temples of modern India as we, as we see them, your dams and your uh, industries. Uh, the other such, uh, another such uh, open jail was in Solapur, right? Uh, where uh, many uh, nomadic and denotified, uh, at that time they were criminal tribes, persons were made to do this kind of hard labor in the textile uh, looms over there. So um, now, if one is to understand uh, what this discourse uh, is doing, you know, I, I, I'm I'm sorry, I'm, I try to give a context, a pre-colonial and a post-colonial, uh, a pre-colonial and a colonial context of what happened to the criminal tribes. But um, if one is to see that especially uh, uh, in the debates uh, that led up to the constitution, right? Um, uh, there, is, there was a certain discomfort in treating these communities, the ones criminalized communities as equal citizens. Um, the Criminal Tribes Act uh, stayed on, we got our independence on 19, uh, 15th of August, 1957, but the Criminal Tribes Act stayed on uh, till 1952, right? When it was finally repealed. And all these criminal communities or criminal tribes uh, basically were denotified, right? Um, and um, the Ayangar Committee, which actually was set up to look into the condition of uh, the criminal tribes and the, and the working of the Criminal Tribes Act and was supposed to suggest a repealment of the act, uh, of course, it did its job it repealed the act. It, one of its recommendations was to repeal the act. But what it did insidiously was also that it said that there is still a necessity to have a law that identifies habitual offenders, right? Uh, so on the one hand, it repealed the Criminal Tribes Act, but it also saw that a need for an act to uh, identify or to classify certain individuals as habituated to commissioning to, to the commission of crime or offense, right? Um, and in post-colonial India, then uh, you see that the Habitual Offenders Act stays, right? Uh, the one modification between the Criminal Tribes Act and the Habitual Offenders Act is this, that the Criminal Tribes Act criminalized communities, whereas the Habitual Offenders Act criminalized uh, or, or classified individuals as habitual offenders. Uh, but you see that uh, uh, it is not uh, very different uh, in its actual functioning. It is the same communities that are targeted and criminalized uh, and subjected to uh, a lot of exploitation and oppression uh, under the act, under the Habitual Offenders Act. And these are the same communities uh, that had been criminalized by the Criminal Tribes Act. Right. Um, and interestingly, uh, the, the Habitual Offenders Act, its constitutional validity has been challenged uh, many a times. We have close to nine states uh, that have nine or 10 states that have their sp uh, specific state Habitual Offenders Acts. Uh, but uh, especially stringent amongst these acts is, uh, is the act of Madras, right? The Madras. Um, uh, Habitual Offenders Act. And you will see that uh, when the constitutional validity of this act was challenged, uh, the, uh, it was upheld. The constitutional validity of the act was upheld and the court said that we need this law. And it is interesting to see the reasoning of the judge uh, in, this, uh, in upholding this law. Uh, this is a case called P. Arumugham from the Madras High Court. So P. Arumugham versus State of uh, Madras, uh, which upheld the constitution validity of the Habitual Offenders Act. Uh, in the judgment, the Madras High Court emphasized on the act's purpose. I'm talking of a judgment after independence, after the Indian constitution that uh, envisaged equal rights uh, for everyone, right? But here you have the court say, uh, the, em it emphasized on the act's purpose on the protection of general public from a comparatively small section of society who are by reason of hereditary and traditional inclinations 
or by inherent nature prone to commit a serious offence. So this is the reasoning that the court is providing, and it is entrenched. If you see, this is 1953, and it is entrenched uh, in these notions of hereditary criminality that can be traced to a the pre-colonial times, the Manusmriti, and the Criminal Tribes Act, right, which said that certain communities are inclined uh, to committing uh, crimes, right? Um, and, and you don't see a lot of difference in the actual functioning of the either the Habitual Offenders Act in various states uh, or the Habitual Offenders provisions in the form of Section 110 uh, of the CRPC. And a recent example of this is when these provisions, uh, many of which uh, have been used against Dalit Adivasi Vimukta communities. And I will cite a few examples of some very basic provisions that have been used to um, target these communities. Nikita here is an expert on uh, how the Excise Law and Gambling Act, et cetera, have been used and they have conducted uh, extensive studies uh, on how they, these, these laws have been used to target uh, marginalized identities. But I will uh, try to focus on uh, the section, section 110 of the CRPC, which is a habitual offenders provision, which basically empowers the police to classify certain individuals as habitual offenders. And then it sort of, um, it, uh, it is a preventive policing practice where uh, a surety uh, of good behavior is, is expected and demanded uh, from an individual who is uh, classified as, an habitual, as a habitual offender. Now, the case of Suvarna Saive is very uh, interesting and very important actually to understand how these provisions such as habitual offenders uh, provisions are you know, you can trace them from the Criminal Tribes Act, but the, you will see their traces, um, you will see their presence uh, in today's times. So Suvarna Sarve, a 24-year-old Dalit girl from, um, uh, you know, a slum in Mumbai, uh, is, she's an activist, a, a, you know, a brilliant a, a protester, and uh, sh she is a singer. Um, and she was protesting at the time of the anti-CANRC protests, and she was leading the protests at the time. And she was uh, sent a notice. So an FIR was lodged against her for protesting. And when the FIR was lodged, uh, it was an unlawful, um, uh, 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 the charges were that it was an unlawful assembly. And when the FIR was lodged, this was the first ever FIR against Suvarna. Um, and I am talking about people who are habituated to committing, commissioning, com committing offenses, right? So Suvarna, this is, she's a first time offender. Um, this is the first FIR lodged against her, but she receives a notice from the police which says that uh, we are demanding a surety of 50 lakh from you uh, for good be of good behavior um, and, uh, and for a period of two years. And for a period of two years, if we do not see that you're complying with uh, this, um, uh, you know, uh, we, with, with our requirement, uh, then uh, we will confiscate either the property in the form of the surety or, or the amount of 50 lakhs. So, um, and, and again, she was also issued a notice of externment, which is a tadipar notice where you have, where you were uh, sent outside the district limit or the city limits um, uh, as again, a preventive policing practice, right? Um, and here is, you know, this young girl, you know, Dalit girl, lives in a slum and the police is, is using this provision um, just arbitrarily actually misusing the provision. Um, and there is so much discretion to the police over here. Now, it's not just the police, but there is also the collusion of the executive magistrate in the use of section 110. You see that uh, there needs to be a sanction from the executive magistrate for this. So the executive magistrate and the police uh, are coming together and uh, imposing such, such, a, such a hefty surety. Uh, and expecting and demanding that kind of surety from uh, someone like Suvarna Sarve. Um, the other um, incident that I would like to point out is that of um, um, the Bhima Koregao protests. And even as we speak about uh, dissenting individuals who are associated with Bhima Koregao and Elgar Parishad, and we know their names, uh, but we often forget that there were dissenting protesters uh, and these were Dalit protesters thousands of them on streets. And what was happening to them is, is something that we have not uh, known or talked about. So when Bhima Koregao, the violence in uh, Bhima Koregao happened 
in 2018, it was a one-sided violent attack on the Dalit community that was coming there in to Bhima to Korega to pay their homage on the 200th um, uh, year of uh, the Battle of Bhima Korega. Um, and you saw that um, when the attack happened and a one-sided attack on the Dalits who had gathered there had ha happened, um, a lot of Dalit, uh, you know, young, young people came on the streets and protested against that violent attack. In fact, um, Prakash uh, Ambedkar ji gave a call uh, for protests. Uh, and there were thousands of these youngsters who were protesting. And in the aftermath of these protests, what you saw was that the police themselves uh, registered 655 FIRs. So these were all these FIRs were, uh, you know, registered by the police officials uh, against the protesting Dalit youth, the, the protesting Dalit youngsters. And in these 655 FIRs, you would see that uh, each FIR would have some 200, 250, 300 unnamed Dalits, right? Uh, and the locations that mentioned were mentioned there were, uh, you know, Dalits from Ambedkar Basti, Ramabai Basti, Bhim Basti, you know, these kind of locations. Um, and what it did was, in effect, in these 655 FIRs, if you see and you uh, if you if you were you know one would study those FIRs, we were studying those FIRs, and we saw that in effect it um, criminalized close to 11,000 uh, Dalit youngsters in Maharashtra, as protesters in Maharashtra at that time, right? So these 11,000 uh, unnamed Dalit youngsters from Ramabai Basti, Bhim Basti, uh, were actually potential targets of the state. And at any point, the state could weaponize and the police could weaponize uh, these FIRs. And they did that. Uh, a, a year later, nothing happened when the FIRs were lodged, but a year later you saw that the police started uh, combing operations. They started summoning, uh, you know, random Dalit youngsters. They started entering these bastis and picking and arresting people, right? Uh, Externment and Dalipan notices were being served. So what it did was it created this immense sense of fear uh, in the Dalit community. Right. So what you, you you therefore see that how the system, you have these dissenting individuals who, who are protesting this violent attack in Bhima Koregao on the one hand, and the system is trying to criminalize them and trying to induce the sense of fear in the community. Right. And it has a chilling effect. It definitely has a chilling effect because these youngsters were approaching lawyers and they did not have legal aid. They did not have the right kind of legal advice. They did not uh, have the resources to fight these cases. Each uh, bail bond would cost them some 25, 30,000 uh, rupees, right? And they did not have that kind of money uh, to be released on bail, right? Uh, so what it did was it instantly created this, this sense of fear in the community, right? And had a chilling effect. What I'm trying to point out is that um, it is these dissenting communities, right, that are completely invisibilized in this discourse. It is their plight that is completely invisibilized in the, in the larger discourse of dissenting individuals or political prisoners. Um, and it is these communities that are depoliticized isn't a, a Dalit youngster protesting against this violent attack uh, political. They are all, in fact, youngsters. Most of them were associated with many Dalit Bahujan political parties, right, at that time. Um, and this, when this happened, this actually happened uh, a few months prior to the general, uh, to the elections in Maharashtra. Um, and it definitely had, uh, you know, a, a certain, uh, effect uh, in terms of, you know, these karyakartas uh, belong, coming from these political parties felt threatened and uh, did not want to, um, and, and they were obviously busy with their legal cases. So, say, so they were not able to do the campaigning for these parties. So there was definitely some sense of, uh, you know, what the government and the, what, the, what the state and the police was doing at that time, very clearly. Um, I would also like to point to another incident, which is uh, the Ramabai uh, killings uh, in Mumbai. In um, this this incident that happened, 
if I'm not wrong, in 1998, um, where uh, Dr. Babaseb Ambedkar's statue was desecrated with a garland of chappals. And people were protesting and Dalit uh, people from the Basti were protesting against it. And they actually um, um, sort of um, um, uh, occupied an area uh, of the highway. Disha, and I'm really SRP, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, you have yeah. five minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll quickly wind up. I'll quickly wind up. Yeah. So um, the the Ramabai incident, if one looks at it, is where uh, the SRPF then. Uh, these were dissenting individuals. These were individuals who were unhappy uh, and who were extremely agitated uh, with how um, uh, Dr. Babasaheb Ambedkar's statue was desecrated. And they were protesting. And the SRPF, um, you know, the, the sub inspector of the SRPF um, gave orders to fire at an unarmed crowd. And close to 11 um, Dalit people were killed. Um, close to 20, 25 people were injured. Um, and um, the inquiry actually found that the sub-inspector who gave these orders uh, had multiple atrocities cases filed by Dalits against him. So, I mean, the question <laughs> comes, uh, and the question therefore is, what about the descent of these communities and isn't it political? Uh, why is this descent depoliticized? Why, why are these communities depoliticized in the larger discourse on dissent? And why is there no talk about uh, these dissenting communities? Uh, I would, I, I think, and I would conclude now, uh, I had to, I wanted to speak a little about the Anti-Begging Act. Nikita, if you can give me some five minutes more. Yeah, you have five. Touch Take upon five. the Anti-Begging yeah, Law. Yeah, go ahead. It is one legislation, one piece of legislation that we, uh, do not know about. It is a law that criminalizes begging. Uh, in India, um, you will see that the Anti-Begging Act, uh, the main act is that of Maharashtra, the Bombay uh, Prevention of Begging Act, and close to 20 states have uh, adopted this act. And what this act does it, it is, is it criminalizes begging. But it also somewhere equates uh, the fact that there are nomadic communities, commu entertainer communities such as Dombaris, Madaris, Makadwale, you know, these kind of communities, Nats, uh, these kind of the ones that you see, you know, performing acrobats on the streets, these kind of communities, uh, they, they, their occupation and their traditional occupation, their intergenerational occupation uh, has been equated with begging. And begging, the act of begging has been criminalized. So what you see is that, uh, the traditional occupations, uh, the mode and manner of leading and living your life, right? Uh, those that mode and manner has been criminalized by this by these laws, and uh, the punishment, in fact, in the anti-begging law goes up to ten years, right? Um, and this kind of in incarceration, either in begging uh, a beggar's home, or say in, um, you know, there is also a provision where the incarceration can be, uh, you know, they can be put into prisons as well. So this kind of incarceration, what it does is it criminalizes the only mode of survival for such communities that have been extremely, extremely, that are extremely marginalized and pushed to, have been pushed to the margins, right? So they are left with no source of livelihood, no source of survival. If you see the condition of Pardi community and you will see a lot of these communities uh, a lot of uh, Pardi people on street signals selling small things like, you know, lemons or like books or toys or, or either begging also on the streets. You will see that they are subject to constant harassment by the police, uh, by these anti-begging squads. Um, and they are constantly put in these begging homes, uh, beggars' homes. And the beggars' homes, in fact, have a prov provision where children are separated from their parents. Right, um, and they are put into uh, children's homes. So, so the fact that the Pardi community, which is a hunting community, 
their occupation, their traditional livelihood, which is hunting, has been criminalized by the state. Okay, one might advocate for protection of wildlife, which again, I don't agree with, and Nikita will tell us about how uh, there is a schedule uh, five and um, uh, why, uh, uh, you know, this, this kind of criminalization of Parsis or, or certain hunting communities is, is not um, uh, reasonable. But let's go beyond that. And let's say that the traditional occupation has been criminalized. And let's say there is a law now. Uh, but the fact that you have ousted these communities uh, from the forests, they have been ousted from their jal jungle zameen. The only mode of livelihood source of survival for these communities is to come to cities and do these meager menial jobs. Uh, and and they're living on the streets in these shanties alongside roads under flyovers, trying to meet and make ends meet. But you again see that the state comes up with another law, the Anti-Begging Act, which criminalizes the fact that these communities um, uh, are living on the streets or, or they're living under flyovers and they are criminalized and subject to constant police harassment. So the, the final you know, question uh, before us is that uh, the erasure and the invisibilization of all these dissenting communities, right? Um, what happens because of this erasure? I, according to me, this erasure is extremely casteist. Uh, if if uh, the mainstream Savannah civil liberties discourse uh, can highlight and focus on individual dissenting individuals, then why is it that it cannot see the plight of lacks of these dissenting communities, the communities that have been criminalized and that face criminalization on a day to day basis? Uh, according to me, it is casteist and it is discriminatory. Uh, I think that. Uh, just to conclude, I, I think that uh, this discourse of uh, over-visibilization and hyper-visibilization of dissenting individuals, mostly Brahmin Savanna, and the invisibilization and depoliticization of dissenting communities with such a history, uh, unjust history uh, of criminalization and state persecution is essentially casteist and creates a hierarchy of uh, those who are incarcerated and those who are criminalized. Uh, what it also does is it normalizes uh, the Brahminist social order, the, Brahm the caste colonial system that is responsible for this kind of criminalization. Because then when you're talking about dissenting individuals, you're only talking about the state and the regime, right? You're not talking, you're only talking about the regime. You're talking about this government or that government, but you're not talking uh, about the systems that are responsible for this kind of criminalization, right? So there is a need to center caste um, in these discussions. And when you erase dissenting communities, you erase caste and you almost treat dissent and criminalization of dissent as this post-caste phenomena, right? Um, so, so I feel that uh, all in all, um, I feel that this kind of depoliticization is deliberate and there is a need to look at uh, all these communities uh, the marginalized castes, tribes, nomadic and wandering communities, the Avarna communities that have been criminalized uh, and to endow them with, with the politicity that they deserve. Um, and then there is uh, therefore a need to center the dissenting communities in this entire discourse uh, around civil liberties. And to just conclude, I would just say, and I would quote from uh, what Dr. Babasaheb Ambedkar writes and Gandhi Jinnah and um, Ranade and Jinnah, and he's, he's comparing, uh, he, he's, he was actually delivering a lecture on uh, Ranari's 101st birth anniversary, and he was uh, comparing a social reformer to a political reformer. And he says that a social reformer is a much greater, um, you know, is, is much more courageous and much, import, much more important than a political reformer. And by political reformer, he meant that, you know, individuals, and he also refers to political prisoners there. And he says that individuals who, uh, fight the government, who challenge the government are important, yes, but individuals that fight the society are, are much more important and much more courageous and their work is much more uh, important. And he's, he talks about how society, and especially the society entrenched in the in caste system, uh, has the potential of tyranny and oppression to a far, far, far greater extent than any government can have. Right, uh, and he 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 concludes on that, and he says that uh, therefore it is important to also look at society uh, and its carceral. This is me 
paraphrasing it, but it's carceral potential, as I would like to say. When um, a Dalit, yeah, a Dalit youngster is uh, murdered for spotting a mustache. Uh, when someone is lynched for consuming the food of their choice. Uh, when someone is uh, lynched and killed or threatened for wanting to marry outside their caste fold. This is the carceral potential of the Brahminic society that we are talking about. This carceral potential of the Brahminical society continues to uh, criminalize individuals, continues to curb and erode civil liberties of individuals on a day-to-day -day basis. This is the everyday, everyday carcerality that we need to talk about and that we need to center. So I would, I would end on this and uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Disha. There is just so much ground to cover and I'm uh, really sorry I had to interrupt you because I think there are just so many different aspects to flesh out. Uh, I think like a lot of what, I mean, the sort of food for thought that Disha has offered to us and I think like I said at the beginning of this talk uh, that the struggle is to be able to, you know, talk about the question of politicization and the politicization of a certain section of people and the way in which the, the so-called mainstream discourse has managed to individualize that question, right? And I think Disha in her talk so beautifully talks about how there are communities and certain ways of living, uh, particularly those of you know, those who belong to Dalit Adivasi uh, and Vimukta communities that have been in so many ways uh, synonymous with being uh, dissenting, right? Or or with challenging the status quo in so many ways. And I think, I think from that, I have one or two questions to ask you, Disha, and your thoughts on them. Um, I mean, I know you said that there is an invisibilization of this, lived experience and these struggles of so many communities uh, by southern activists and therefore there's that carving out of the category of political prisoners and to say that there are certain section of, section of people whose criminalization and subsequent incarceration is political right but a lot of the conversations around criminalization or talking about over criminalization or making a case for disproportionate criminalization there is one standard data set that everybody uses, which is the National Crime Records Bureau data set, which is to say, you know, it's almost become like this. It's it's a mandatory requirement to say in any talk about the criminal justice uh, system where everybody says, oh, SC, ST, OBCs are overrepresented in the criminal justice system, right? So uh, from that data point of view, that criminalization and the targeting of those communities is not lost, right? I mean whether it's the movement on uh, sexual violence in this country, you know, whether pushing for more stringent criminal laws, right? Even if you were to look at the other side of investing in the criminal justice system, looking for more stringent criminal laws, we see that uh, the custodial rape struggle is informed by Mathura, the law on sexual harassment at the workplace came as a result of Bhavi Devi. The arrest guidelines in DK Basu uh, came as a result of Budan Sabar's death. So I want to understand what is it that allows for the deaths of certain people and all of them belonging to Bahujan communities, uh, allows for movements to be built around these issues, but strangely in the sort of legal framing of the issues or the political framing of these issues, uh, this entire narrative or like the lives of those around whose this movement, quote unquote, movement is built like that, that particular narrative is lost. So I want, like, I, I would like to hear your thoughts in terms of like the politics behind that. And if you could share your thoughts on that, it'd be useful. Yeah, I mean, Nikita, you've answered it, uh, I, I think in the question, I think because the fact that uh, we are always data points, you know, we are always uh, uh, the Dalit Bahujan Adivasi Vimukta communities, their struggles, their resistance, um, uh, their uh, lost lives, 
uh, become data for for these kind of uh, quote unquote so called reforms legal reforms right uh, or criminal justice reforms um and they never tend to benefit these communities we saw that and we spoke about that uh, you know as far as the vishaka guidelines is concerned and you also see uh, this um, you know with the the sort of uh, reforms that are coming up or the committees that are being set for some kind of reform in the criminal law the recent uh, sort of the the criminal reforms committee that was set up right and there was not a single dalit adivasi bahujan person on that committee it was an all savarna community an all male community uh, uh, sorry uh, an all male member committee right um so so the fact that you become data points for uh, and and this kind of um um uh, you know data like you said you know the N ncrb data or the over criminalization or the disproportionate criminalization data is used and it doesn't benefit uh these communities in any way in fact it, their invisibilization is at every level it's at the level of policy it's at the level of uh law making um and and they are not centered uh, in any of uh, uh this so i i think that uh, that 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 larger uh sort of politics of uh, the way this is happening you know the, the politics of uh policy framing or framing of laws uh, is very evident uh in terms of who it benefits and on whose backs it is built right yeah i i hope i try to answer no no you definitely did i mean before we move to the audience questions and there are quite a few here uh i just have one quick question also to ask you and i mean you closed your before that nikita uh, can i just point by... out uh, yeah. can i just point out and if we have time uh and we don't have enough questions if uh, if that's the case then i because you mentioned budhan sabar's case and how it sort of led to yeah, these yeah yeah if you could talk a bit life. more about if budhan sabar's case budhan sabar's case budhan, budhan, budhan yeah yeah uh budhan sabar came from a denotified tribal community a sabar community which is which is a criminalized tribal community from west bengal and like every criminal tribes community most of us have seen the movie jai bhim right and the the depiction of the uh, the person in in that movie is that again of a denotified tribal individual though it has been completely erased the history of criminal tribes act the history of habitual uh, offenders act uh, and and the criminal stigma that the community faces has been completely erased from the movie um so so one could understand that the depiction is that of the denotified tribe and now you i'm i i will tell you about the budhan sabar case so budhan sabar came from this similar you know de notified tribal community a community that was criminalized um and he was just uh, uh, you know going uh, to some place traveling uh, along with his wife when he was picked by the police he was at a pawn shop and his wife was there with him and he was picked from pawn shop from by the police um he was arrested the day he was arrested that day the police has not did not record uh, uh you know uh, that that he was arrested that day the the record shows that the police diary shows that the arrest was recorded on the next day right so he was arrested a day prior but that the record did not show that in a days time uh, it was the wife's claim and her allegation that he was not given water for 24 hours he was beaten brutally beaten by the police in in custody um and you know this kind of uh, sort of arrests uh, and picking of denotified tribes individuals in any kind of unnamed sort of offenses because they are easy targets uh, they obviously have that kind of uh, you know history of that criminal stigma that stays uh, and and the police targeting happens now in budhan sabar's case uh, a few days after that the wife kept uh you know shouting and she she kept uh, saying that you know he needs to be saved because the police is brutally brutally beating him in police custody a few days three days later he uh is found uh hanging in police custody by a gamcha um and the police declares that it is suicide and the wife says that there is some kind of foul play in this because i have been visiting trying to visit my husband and i have been seeing that he has been uh you know treated um uh, atrociously by the by the police and he has uh, suffered some th third degree kind of uh, treatment in police custody and and this is like a classic case where you will often find denotified tribes 
individuals you know when they die in police custody the police tries to show it as a suicide and it is often they are hanging on some like uh, you know like some low uh, level um, object and uh, by a gamcha right and the police it, it's a, it's a very classic manner in which an sop sort of of sorts where the police shows that it is suicide uh, and uh, the wife then went to the high court and she said that uh, you know this this is definitely a custodial murder by the police this is not suicide and the nhrc then intervened uh, and budhan sabar's body which was buried so coming from adivasi community coming from denotified tribal communities body was buried and it was a post mortem uh, um, uh, this thing was uh, conducted later you know after his body was buried and it was seen that there were multiple hundreds of fractures in the body right so it it just couldn't have been uh, suicide so he was beaten to death um and this actually this case led to a lot of reform um in the law on arrests um and uh, um you know the the arnesh kumar guidelines if there are a few law students here you would know that somewhere uh, has been inspired uh, by by the fact that this is the kind of treatment that individuals from denotified tribes communities face um you know in police custody but again uh, you see that all of this reform when it was happening it was informed by uh, the plight and the death um, and the torture that a denotified tribal individual faced but denotified tribes are completely erased uh, somewhere from this discourse there is no discussion of um, around these communities uh, when it comes to custodial torture yeah i also want to add here which is that this whole idea of the police custody and policing right like the custody and the site of a police station both as a spatial site as a physical space and an institution is one that is marked with caste and brahminical violence right so the fact that someone like budhan sabar or scores of people from you know denotified communities or other bahujan communities are at the receiving end of violence in this space or at, at the receiving end of targeting within the institution of policing is by no means an aberration right because if we go back to the history of the policing the legacy of policing like in the 1840s the sort of origin story of the police is to say that you know you have these people who are criminals by birth and you need a force to be able to surveil control and keep an eye on them and to maintain order right so there is so much even now you know when there are people particularly uh, those who identify themselves as liberals of some kind who are making a case for saying oh you know we need stronger policing and we need stronger law and order it's important to deconstruct what is that law and order and what is that law and order function that we are talking about right because if you go back to the origin story of the police it says that the order function of the police and the law and order function of the police is actually the social order function which is the social order function of caste right Correct. so the way the kind of treatment that is meted out to people from bahujan communities within the police station as a site and within the institution of policing is by no means an aberration because it is what it was designed to do like that is why the institution was created right and the fact that our quest for or these movements that we built around custodial violence whether it was drawing from budhan sabar's case or whether it was drawing from mathura's case the fact that it fails to make that structural case or you know make that structural critique of policing then allows for you know the state and the institution of policing to make a case for saying oh this is a case of a few bad apples right who killed someone like budhan sabar or it is a case of like a few police people police personnel who abused their powers but it's not an abuse of powers it is actually our misunderstanding of what we think the police what is the function that the police serves and what the police is actually been created to do right so therefore this whole quest for reform and that path for reform that we've been on since time immemorial that is why it hasn't yielded any results because this institution is doing exactly what 
it was designed to do so actually it's a very successful institution it's a very efficiently and well functioning institution one of the most well functioning institutions in the country but because there is an expectation mismatch which is why we think it's a broken system right so i think that that sort of analysis is something that is very very crucial to sort of draw out and i mean i'm going to now quickly disha take questions that we have uh yeah one second yeah the first question is if you could talk more about the about pre colonial criminalization and if there are sources apart from the manusmriti that one could rely on to understand this better um i think uh, to be very honest um it has been quite a task uh and and i have done uh, my literature review and i haven't come across many sources and i had to rely on bulas uh, laws of mano for uh, you know to understand whether these communities are just colonial sort of you know this kind of criminalization of communities is only a colonial phenomena or it existed in the manuspriti um but uh, to be very honest at this point this is the only source that i have the other source that uh, i think is could could you know we could be able to link um uh, these things a bit would be um the uh, you know ambedkar's um, the untouchables right where he talks about the 1910 census and you will see that the these these communities uh that have been um called as or referred to as criminal communities in manuspriti like i said the wandering communities the communities residing in forest dwelling on uh you know outside of the villages uh wearing a certain kind of uh you know or engaging in uh tannery or or leather work that kind of occupation and i said that these are you if you look at them they are all avarna communities in fact the manusmriti refers to them as non aryans or excluded aryan communities you will you will be able to link it to uh the 1910 um census report and the 1910 census report is interesting and its column on religion is very interesting and i want to you know sort of say that uh, how some of these communities are non hindu communities right um uh, they are communities like i said they are they are communities that dissented the brahmanic chaturvarna system but they are also referred to as non hindu communities in the 1910 census of the uh, and 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 the 1910 census has a column on religion and this column for the first time included the category of hindus uh christians muslims and also uh, for the first time included the category of non hindus right and non hindus who are not muslims or christians now who are these non hindus and it's interesting to see the criteria there are, there is this this 10 point criteria uh for these so called non hindus who that are that includes certain castes and tribes right and you will see that when you read the criteria that it is referring to the same uh, communities that one would see in the manuswriti right so the first uh, criteria of these non hindus who are not christians and muslims is that they deny the supremacy of brahmins one two they do not they do not receive the mantra from a brahmin or other recognized hindu guru three they deny the authority of vedas four they do not worship the hindu gods five they are they are served by good brahmins as family priests six they uh, have no brahmin priests at all eight um seven sorry they are they are denied access to the interior of hindu temples uh eight cause pollution a by touch or b with uh, a certain distance uh nine they bury their dead ten they eat beef and do not uh, do no reverence to the cow right uh now you look at all these you know, you look at the, these non hindu communities and i'm saying that they are dissenting communities i'm i am impressing that these are your avarna communities these are dalits adivasis uh, nomadic and wandering communities who were later criminalized right and and these communities therefore constitute and one can then therefore link it to the manuspriti and then uh, later on to the colonial criminal tribes act right uh that that criminalize some of these communities and i want to take this opportunity to also um sort of uh, point out that there are so many untouchable communities untouchable uh, communities or even lower castes that have been and and this this notion that we have that it is just uh, tribes that have been criminalized by the colonial era laws i want to debunk that uh, because there is the dushat community from um bihar right which was uh 
uh, registered as a criminal tribe under the Criminal Tribes Act. There is the Chamar community from UP, which was registered as a criminal tribe under the Criminal Tribes Act. In fact, the term Chori Chamari, you know, that, that actually comes from uh, the criminalization of the Chamar community in UP. And there is a brilliant uh, article, and I, I probably want to share that article, which sort of links uh, the occupation of leather tanning and the stereotyping that for leather tanning, the Chamar community is actually uh, uh, indulging into cattle poisoning, right? And therefore, they were criminalized. So there, there's a beautiful article that links it uh, to, to this kind of stereotype. In Maharashtra, in fact, the, there is a community called the Matam, Matam community, which is one of the four or five major uh, scheduled castes in Maharashtra. Uh, they are a nomadic community who are uh, categorized as SCs, and they were criminalized uh, under the Criminal Tribes Act. They were a criminal tribe, uh, right? Uh, the Kuruvan community, in fact, in Tamil Nadu is again uh, categorized as scheduled caste, but they are again a nomadic community uh, with a history of criminalization by the, by the Criminal Tribes Act. So it, you will see that these communities uh, that have been criminalized by the Criminal Tribes Act and various notifications that the government, governors have issued right from time to time. Uh, Nikita, the Criminal Tribes Act it was not did not register these communities at one point in time. Uh, the governor was supposed to issue notifications and orders from time to time. So every time they felt that there was some threat from some caste and some community, which is mostly these communities that we are talking about, these communities have been listed. And the lists that are available to us are actually quite limiting. You know, if you look at the Rainke Commission report, uh, the NCDNT report, you will see that the, the, the tribes that have been um, included as DNTs in some of these, uh, some of the, the, the reports that are, the government reports that are available, don't really show you that the larger picture of the criminalization of so many castes, like I mentioned, and tribes and lower castes and Dalit communities as well. Uh, under the Criminal Tribes Act. Yeah. Uh, there's a question which is, which says, could you please share some of your thoughts on the Juvenile Justice Act and its impact on children from marginalized communities? I am honestly, I am not uh, an expert on this. Uh, and I, I mean, if Nikita, you have something to add to this, all yeah. I know is and can talk about is, um, you know, from what I have seen from the, my visits to beggars, uh, homes and institutions is that uh, somewhere you see that uh, when these communities are incarcerated in these beggars homes, uh, the children are actually separated and one has to again trace this system to the original criminal tribes act where the act um, uh, provided for separation of children and family members from um, you know, the adult members of the family, right? Um, so, um, I, I mean, that's, that's just uh, what I know. Uh, so children, but, yeah. our children were separated and also the sort of data that was collected, right? Because as part of the registration process, uh, there were footprints, fingerprints, a lot of demographic and data about uh, the people who were put in these settlements and criminalized by birth, all of their data was sought. And this also included children, right? Uh, and then post-independence, when the Criminal Tribes Act was repealed and the habitual offenders re regime was ushered in, uh, you saw all of this data of children also being uh, replicated as part of these various dossiers that the police continues to maintain. So they're called history sheeters, rowdy sheeters, so on and so forth, right? Um, and then you, of course, have the Juvenile Justice Act, which says that uh, there's a principle of fresh start, which means if a juvenile in conflict with law, there's a juvenile in conflict with law, that sort of record cannot form a uh, part of their uh, quote unquote criminal record as an adult, right? But we see that happening very often uh, as lawyers, particularly who are representing children uh, from the Mukta communities, you see that, uh, you know, when these children grow up and attain majority, you see that uh, these cases that they were charged under uh, as minors also become part of their record, say for externments or for uh, furnishing these securities uh, under section 110 of the CRPC. So when you pull up the records, you see that several of those cases will be cases that they will be charged for as children, right? And this sort of modus operandi also, you know, that these are criminal children. In very, very often you also see in cases, which is that 
if the parents are charged for offenses you will also see the children being charged and the case being made out to say that the parents are using the children to commit crimes right because one of the like the rationale for the criminal tribes act is that it's hereditary criminality so you are also trying to establish to say that look this is a legacy that is being passed on from one generation to another and not only does the child have criminal instincts but they're also being trained to be a criminal so i think here and also now there is a particularly sort of dangerous uh trend with the digitization of these registers in police stations that you're also going to see the sort of data of children uh being digitized as part of databases that the indian government wants to do uh, with the cctns and now with more recently with the criminal uh, procedure identification bill we will see now uh you know data of children also being digitally encoded and apart from that whether it's in terms of surveillance whether it is in term of torture the kind of violence uh that is meted out to members of vimukta communities as a part of everyday policing uh functions children are also at the receiving end of that there is absolutely no distinction the juvenile justice act uh then just seeks to be on paper and it's something that the that the board also espouses to say that you know that rationale continues right even in before the juvenile justice board under the act when there's a bail application that is heard that rationale is upheld that you know these are uh children who are criminals by birth so inhone ye kiya hi hoga so yeah i mean you, we see that happening i'm going to quickly move on to another question uh the other question is that the innocent until proven guilty principle doesn't apply to criminalized tribe how does the burden of proof shift also the burden of proof be, being beyond reason, reasonable doubts how are scst groups being overrepresented in jails and death trials i think the latter half you have addressed already so uh if we can talk a little bit about the first half of about how the innocent until proven guilty principle uh is turned on its head when it comes to uh vimukta communities yeah uh, i mean it's it's um uh, as if uh, you know these communities are sort of um, you know available to the police and the state uh to sort of um, whenever there is a crime that happens in a vicinity and there is a denotified tribal and and you will see that there are um uh, these communities have been ghettoized wherever they are right uh, and the police uh, station and the police officials often are very much aware and these communities are very much visible and hyper visible in fact in whatever locality they are to the police machinery right uh so every time an offense happens and the police has to show some kind of control on crime uh in the region or in the locality you will often see that uh, if there is an unnamed fir you know uh someone has um uh you know um there is a theft case um and i approach the police and i don't know who uh the the actual offender is who who has committed the offense i will go to the police and i would say that you know i want to register an fir and uh, i have lost some some of these things but i don't know who has done this um and uh, i i i think that the person looked a certain way like this uh and was wearing a mask um and you know like this this, this is what a typical fir looks like and these are these firs are fertile ground for the police to pick and it's an unnamed fir you know and the description of this this so called random person is given in that fir but this is a fertile ground for the police to approach those denotified tribe localities to conduct combing operations over there to harass uh, you know adult uh, or even young very young uh, like nikita was saying you know uh, even juveniles uh, for that matter uh, from these localities of denotified communities and they are picked up and one one such case uh, in fact is that of ankush maruti shinde and nikita you 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 are aware of this case this is a 2018 um you know case um so the judgment came out in 2018 but there were these there was this case um some 16 years back uh where uh there was um a robbery in a house uh, a woman was raped uh she was gang raped so this is this is what the fir looked like she was gang raped and there were six individuals unnamed individuals in that fir and the police actually went on to pick six pardhi men from a pardhi basti right which is a denotified tribe from maharashtra 
um and one of whom so the cause title ankush maruti shinde the, the 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 main guy ankush maruti shinde in the case uh, it is said and it was found that he was actually a juvenile you know he was he was below 18 years of age he was a minor uh when he was picked so these six pardi men were picked by the police in this fir which had un- six unnamed people right um and you see that they languished uh, they were sentenced to death in the lower court um uh, it was upheld their sentences were upheld uh, in the high court uh, one of whom uh, ankush in fact was put in um solitary confinement and the case went to the supreme court the supreme court also ha- upheld um and and held that uh, you know they were in fact guilty these these six men and later a curative petition i think a revision petition was filed uh wherein um a uh, a very famous lawyer from bombay argued that case yuk choudhury and uh, he argued on behalf of these uh pardi men and uh, it was it was found that there was actually no evidence so this is at, at the stage when uh the lower court the high court and the supreme court has said that yes these men were guilty uh but at the curi- at the revision stage uh, review stage it was found that uh, there wasn't enough evidence against these men and the supreme court then ordered for reinvestigation of the case acquitted these six men saying that there is no evidence against them uh, and these men were languishing in in the jail for 16 whole years and and some compensation of like i think 5 lakh or 4 lakh was awarded you know and and this is literally these men when they were picked they were 18 19 and by the time they came out you know they were they, their entire you know uh, youth was basically lost in jail and um there there's a there's a story you know that um, that that records uh, one of uh, these six persons uh, and their statement after they were released and they were acquitted and it was said that you know the the case in fact against them uh, was all a doctored case by the police and there was um, all of this that happened and uh, the the person uh, is asked that how do you feel now and he says that it was said in the fir that these are the hands of a person uh, who raped and murdered people um, and for 16 years i was told that this is the hand of of this man uh, but this literally is a hand of a hard working man um and uh, uh, you know it's it's a very pregnant story it's 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 um it's it's so representative of what continues to happen to uh, the many uh, criminalized tribes renotified tribes persons pardis sabars charas kurvars um so um i'm sorry i forgot the original question but i no, hope no, i think you I answered it I, yeah I, yeah, I, yeah I you did question. you did i just want to add here that you know with someone like ankush maruti shinde in a case like that also the sort of determination of a habitual offender and the category of a habitual offender is so pernicious that even after being acquitted and being acquitted by the highest constitutional court of this country one can continue to be treated as a, as a habitual offender right because it's not something that is contingent on acquittal so it's almost policing powers and powers of the police that are operating in some sort of constitutional void and a void even also like even like it's almost like the crpc and constitutional provisions and fundamental tenets of criminal law are completely turned on its head when it comes to the determination of habitual offenders because it's it's almost like once you are a habitual offender it's 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 like there is no right to be forgotten right your data uh, your measurements and the criminalization and this surveillance and, and i just want to talk about what this surveillance means right a little bit because you know very often we think that criminalization is only incarceration right also because and disha has elaborated on this so beautifully in her talk where she's talking about the category of political prisoners what that has also done is confined the conversation of criminalization to incarceration alone but criminalization for scores of communities particularly women communities means you can't go to the market because you are under police surveillance if you go to the market and the police asks acha naam batao you say pardi kanjar you know you can be picked up you can be taken to the thana and either you can be charged with the case or there have been instances most recently 
uh, in Madhya Pradesh of a Pardi man who went to the market to shop for his daughter's wedding was picked up by the police, taken to the thana and then killed in police custody. He was charged under the Excise Act for being in possession of mahua. Uh, you know, it also means that for gatherings, right, including weddings, you're required to take permission from the local police station. Uh, you know, weddings in Pardi families, the first invitation that has to be given is an invitation uh, that is attested to an application to the local police station asking for permission because the assumption is that if a group of Pardis are congregating, uh, it means it is to conspire to commit a crime, right? So where it, it means that, you know, children are dropping out of schools because they're picked up by the police. So it's a, it's a 360 degree web of criminalization one that has an all-encompassing effect on the lives of people uh, that we're talking about and it ranges far beyond incarceration and even when it results in incarceration it continues even after one has been released from prison so I think it's important to talk about the sort of web of criminalization and an entire structure uh, that is designed to criminalize and uh, you know in so many ways oppress certain groups that we're talking about here and we'll before moving on we just have one final question uh disha which is talking about uh you know that obcs are mainly understood as a dominant community but you're talking about vimuktas so many of whom are classified uh, as obc so you know how can we understand uh, the criminalization of OBCs. And I mean, I'm going to rephrase the question a little bit uh, to talk about this sort of status categorization, right? Uh, because unlike scheduled castes, scheduled tribes who have their own category, there is, barring maybe Maharashtra and a couple of other states, there is no separate administrative categorization of DNTs uh, and nomadic tribes, right? And so I want to understand, and I think this is what this question is also alluding to, uh, is one is what impact does the lack of an administrative categorization do to the struggles, the historical struggles uh, and plight of the Mukta communities? And secondly, uh, what, and this is drawing more from the question that has been asked, uh, what does being clubbed under the category of OBCs, which is uh, almost like the most sort of heterogeneous category, uh, what does it do to then um, the struggles and the narratives of the muktas and the, the history of their criminalization so it's a two part question yeah um so nikita um before i answer this question i want to point out that uh, when one is talking about uh the nomadic and denotified communities and tdnts it is not a small population it is not uh, you know that a small number of people are being treated this way so you know it's i mean all right this is a population of close to 10 to 15 percent uh, people, right? Um, it, it's we are talking about um, you know ten to fifteen percent nomadic, semi-nomadic, um, and denotified tribes. Um, so it is it is not a small population. But um, even before I talk about the administrative categorization of uh, the NTDNT communities, I would say that um, this category um, uh, of NTDNTs, um, you know, is is not new. Like you said, you know, there are a few states that have a separate category, such as Maharashtra has a separate category of VJNT category, or uh, in fact, Tamil Nadu also has a DNC category, denotified communities. But apart from these two states, you don't see this category. But I would like to take you a little, uh, you know, um, in history, uh, where uh, continuously in many of these commissions uh, in colonial times, one of which is the Sharps Commission, you will see that along with the depressed classes, which is, you know, who have now been administratively categorized as scheduled caste, then you have the scheduled tribes, which is the forest communities. There was a third category uh, that existed in all these pre-constitutional commissions and talks on uh, the conditions of uh, some of these minority com communities, right? Uh, and their demands. And the third category was that of the criminal tribes. Um, but all of a sudden, you know, you see that uh, the depressed classes find in the constitution, they find a schedule for themselves called the scheduled caste. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, the forest communities, the Adivasi community finds a separate schedule for them. Uh, but you see that the criminal tribes uh, are not to be seen as, as a separate category that has, uh, you know, who has suffered historic, uh, historic injustice. Um, and that, that, that kind of erasure in the constitution is, uh, really, in my um, understanding, a sort of um, uh, the the problem 
uh, the the reason why you know the uh, nomadic and denotified communities have not been able to come out of of this cycle of criminality and this cycle of oppression and exploitation that they face um uh, because uh, there are i think close to 15 or 20 um, sort of uh, reports and commissions on ntd nt communities and most of these uh, commissions and reports will point out that as far as social indicators are concerned economic indicators are concerned educational indicators are concerned the nomadic denotified communities fare far worse than the scheduled caste or the scheduled tribe communities this is not to say that denotified tribes or nomadic communities do not find a uh, place within the scheduled caste or scheduled tribe category they do they also find place in the obc category like uh, you know the question pointed out so now you see that the nomadic and denotified community has been uh, basically put into all these categories the scheduled caste scheduled tribe and obc category and most prominently the obc category because they are an afterthought uh, for for the idea of uh, you know your uh, your constitutional uh, liberal democracy right uh, so this community because it came as an afterthought a lot of um, these communities and castes and tribes uh, were the who were criminalized were put into um the the obc fold now the understanding of most people when they when they re refer to obcs as dominant caste and this according to me the term dominant caste is extremely problematic and has been forwarded by many savarna academics such as you know mn shrinivas uh, who have been extremely problematic uh, in that sense um and um, it 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 somewhere says that these are communities that are sub varna communities that are that are within the varna fold so the reference is to the shudra community but obc is as close to 4000 castes right it it is not it it is it is a category of so many castes and it has nomadic community communities it has denotified communities that like we saw are a varna communities they they fall outside of the varna fold right so equating some of these quote on quote dominant castes uh, that the rohi rohini commission points out is you know close to some uh, 40 50 castes you know uh, that are land owning and calling them oppressors uh, to me is really the distortion that the brahmin savarna academics want right um, and and they do not want to want you to understand the obc category as a whole that comprises of so many different uh, castes and tribes that fall outside the varna fold uh, that have had um, you know uh, the worst um, um, uh, you know that have been uh, really oppressed uh, by the caste system and that continue to uh, live in dire uh, really um, bad conditions till date so um, i think that uh, i hope that i have answered the question i, I think that uh, uh this this whole obc as uh the uh, equating obc to shudra a um uh, is is factually wrong uh b that obc uh, are all all these 4000 castes are dominant castes uh is not at all informed by any data in fact if one wants to look at the data one could look at the recent rohini commission report and the kind of castes that it says are Uh, and it attributes um, uh, that kind of uh, so-called "quote unquote" dominance uh, to a few uh, castes from the entire OBC fold, and the the rest of the castes and the communities. In fact, the Pasmanda community uh, falls within the OBC fold. Uh, Dalit Muslim communities have not been recognized by the constitution as as scheduled castes. They fall in the OBC fold. The Sachar Committee report refers to so many uh, Muslim. uh dalit muslim community so many nomadic communities like uh the kalandars uh you know madaris you know some of some of Nats, these nomadic yeah, yeah muslim community or nats uh in fact so it, it's interesting to see that the nat community in up uh uh the the hindu nats are uh scheduled castes and they've been categorized as scheduled castes now nat again is a criminal tribe um which which has been a community that has been criminalized but they are uh administratively categorized as scheduled castes uh when uh, if if you're a nat hindu but if you're a nat muslim then uh, you become obc right so when when we when we have this sort of uh, umbrella kind of understanding of obcs which is already like this uh, uh you know um such a complex category uh it does great disservice to extremely extremely disenfranchised marginalized communities 
um in fact communities like fase pardhi you know that that face the worst kind of dis- uh, criminalization in the worst live in the worst kind of conditions if you go on all your um you know traffic signals in mumbai in pune you will see that you will often see that most people on these poli- uh, on these traffic signals are people from pardhi communities right and and they do not have any kind of uh, permanent residence they do not have they live in shanties uh they they are completely disenfranchised they are completely uh you know out of your any understanding of equal citizenship doesn't apply to these communities um and when when you when i mean to me this idea of referring to someone like fase pardis um that face that kind of criminalization that face that kind of um exclusion and disenfranchisement uh as dominant or as oppressor to me it seems absurd in um, in madhya pradesh sorry in the district yeah. of bhopal pardis are in the general category which was in 2002 as a result of what can only be attributed to a gross clerical error which hasn't been fixed yet even after two decades they were put in the general category and i think like if we were to go by statist categories of understanding violence and understanding oppression um uh, it's going to i mean we're going to fail miserably miserably because uh, these categories are ultimately designed to not just oversimplify uh, the idea of oppression and the idea of marginalization but uh, also in so many ways invisibilize different complexities of marginalization right as disha pointed out you know with the nat community uh, the hindus being in the scheduled caste category and the muslims being uh, in the obc category and i think uh, these sort of status formulations are ones that we have to be extremely wary of uh, in terms of understanding oppression and understanding uh, how caste oppression manifests itself we close for today then thank you so much this was a fascinating uh, discussion to say the least and i think everybody who's been a part of this conversation uh, is walking away with so much to think about and hopefully the questions that we ask about uh questions about criminalization and dissent uh, will be more informed questions uh from now on and also questions uh, that are more sort of acutely aware uh, of the contextual realities that we are operating in um and a big big thank you to disha uh, for bringing it all together and curating it so wonderfully in her comments i will now invite uh, rupali to offer Uh, the vote of thanks uh, thank you again everyone thank you for the opportunity jai hind jai savitri and 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 just um, rupali before you uh, go i think um, thanks um, dbav i have been associated with this group for a really long time and uh, thanks uh, rosa luxemburg uh, foundation for having me um, and um, thank you in fact for um, you know uh, having this session Uh, and organizing this session with nikita i would really like to thank nikita this uh, has been uh, an extremely enriching uh, session for me and uh, a very learning experience uh, so thanks uh, and 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 a big thank you to uh, rupali and swati and uh, for for uh, bringing out this this brilliant initiative and uh, you know ensuring that uh, you know these uh, amazing conversations happen thank you uh i'm okay uh, i'm still uh, seeing professor bandas uh, hand raised i wish i wish her i mean i wish you recover soon she wrote that she is down with covid i would like to thank everyone for joining for our today's session and thanks to nikita and disha both of you for the amazing i mean it was really engaging and thought provoking i'm sure people have take, people have you've given a lot of for all of us actually to think about um and i would request everyone to join for our future sessions the links are there in your um, in the chat box and if you have any feedback for us on how we could do this better um please uh, write to us on the given email addresses and um, have a good evening all of you bye bye jai bhim good evening bye